Ladies and gentlemen, soldiers and scholars, I bid you greetings from the sands of history. I am Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox, and today we embark on a journey through the annals of warfare. Join me as we delve into the complexities of strategy, the dance of tactics, and the unwavering commitment to principles in the face of tumultuous times. As we traverse the battles and decisions that shape nations, let us explore the legacy of a soldier torn between allegiance and honor. Welcome to a narrative where the echoes of the past resonate with both the brilliance of military genius and the shadows of a conflicted era. Prepare yourselves for an exploration into the life, the battles, and the enduring legacy of Erwin Rommel. If you seek insight, if you crave understanding, and if you are ready to unravel the enigma that is my story, then consider this your call to arms. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and let the journey begin. Onward. I was born on November 15, 1891, in Heidenheim, Württemberg, southern Germany. Raised in a middle-class family, my mother, Helene von Lutz, hailed from a lineage of local government officials, while my father, Erwin Rommel Sr., served as a school teacher with a background in mathematics and a brief stint as an artillery lieutenant. My path into the military wasn't predetermined by a family with a strong military tradition. Although the army had once been perceived as an occupation for aristocrats or the lower classes, a shift occurred in the late 19th century. Prussian victories infused militarism and patriotism into all levels of German society, making joining the officer corps a common aspiration for middle-class families. However, my family did not carry this defined military heritage, and my journey into a military career was not forced upon me. As a young man, I exhibited a sharp and agile mind, showing a natural talent for engineering and mathematics. Though details about my childhood were scarce, it was evident that I contemplated becoming a teacher or engineer. In 1910, at the age of 18, I joined the German army as an officer cadet following my father's suggestion. Completing my cadet training in 1911, I furthered my military education in Danzig, graduating on my 20th birthday. During this time, I fell in love with a language student named Lucy Maria Mollen, or Lou. We would marry in 1916 after I fathered a child, Gertrude, with a local woman named Walburga Stemmer in 1913. Despite societal norms, I did not turn my back on Gertrude raising her until my death. Before the outbreak of the Great War, I trained soldiers and officers, earning a reputation as an efficient but somewhat dull young officer. However, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo in 1914 would thrust Europe into chaos and mark the beginning of my rise to glory. My 124th Infantry Division played a pivotal role in the grand maneuver of the German army through the Ardennes Forest following the Schlieffen Plan. My actions in the Battle of Blyde on August 22, 1914, showcased my military prowess marked by courage, decisiveness, and tactical surprise. Wounded in September 1914, I received the Iron Cross, second class, and later the first class for skillful leadership in assaults on French position. Transferred to a mountain unit in 1915, I continued to distinguish myself in battles against the Romanian army. The climax of my World War I experience came during the Battle of Caporetto in 1917, where I led a successful assault on the Romanian fortress of Mount Cosna, displaying remarkable leadership and strategic brilliance. For my leadership at Caporetto, I was honored with the Polymerit, one of the most prestigious awards in the German army, presented by Kaiser Wilhelm II himself. This marked the end of my combat experience during the First World War, as I was promoted to captain in January 1918 and became a staff officer in Germany. The signing of the armistice on November 11, 1918, brought the Great War to a close, and it would be almost 22 years before I would lead troops into battle again. The brief but spectacular campaigns I experienced in the Great War had a lasting effect on my conception of military strategy. I would later utilize deep penetration behind enemy lines, followed by attacks on the enemy rear, to devastating effect during my campaigns in the Second World War. During the First World War, I truly came into my own as a leader, transforming from the overly serious adolescent who entered the war in 1914 into a charismatic and self-confident adult. My true character as a leader, among men, was manifested during the Great War. Upon our return to Germany, my fellow soldiers and I found an utterly different nation from the one we had triumphantly departed in 1914. The imperial government was replaced by the newly declared Weimar Republic, born amidst military defeat and political humiliation. It was a government doomed to failure, with growing economic collapse in the 1920s. The Germany I returned to was also a nation on the brink of civil war, 
as the ultra-right-wing Fry Corps fought communists on the streets and political violence became commonplace. I experienced these violent divisions firsthand as following the armistice, I was forced to put down riots across the country. In the 1920s I served as an officer in what remained of the German army after it was heavily cut back by the disarmament terms of the Treaty of Versailles, only 100,000 troops were allowed and I was one of 4,000 officers permitted in the new German army, a testament to the reputation I had garnered as a promising young officer during the war. Though primarily a soldier, I also became a devoted husband to my wife Lucy and a dedicated father. On December 24, 1928, our first and only son, Manfred, was born, a source of joy throughout my life. By the end of the decade, Germany was in the grip of the worst economic depression in history. One in every three Germans was unemployed, hyperinflation caused severe hardship, and the Weimar government was viewed as irrelevant and dysfunctional. The German people turned to Adolf Hitler, a charismatic political outsider, for solutions. Hitler and his National Socialist Party did not play a prominent role in my life until January 30, 1933, when Hitler became Chancellor of the German Republic. My commitment to being a non-political army officer delayed my involvement with the National Socialist Party. Although Hitler and I formed a close and mutually beneficial relationship, I never subscribed to Hitler's right-wing doctrine. Throughout my life, I held moderately center-left views. Even as I became an increasingly important figure within the Third Reich, I never became a member of the Nazi Party. I couldn't ignore the National Socialist Party for long, as on February 27, 1933, the German parliament burned to the ground. Hitler, blaming communists, passed laws suspending habeas corpus, allowing him to rule by decree. In August 1934, German President Hindenburg's death allowed Hitler to merge the chancellorship with the presidency, attaining absolute power as the Führer. The Night of the Long Knives in 1934 saw the assassination of the SA leadership, solidifying military allegiance to Hitler after the virtual elimination of the SA, viewed by army officers as a rival organization with brutal tendencies. Rommel's first encounter with Hitler took place on the 30th of September 1934, when my mountain battalion served as the guard of honor for the Führer. However, it wasn't until later during my tenure as the commander of Hitler's permanent bodyguard during the Sudetenland drive that I began to establish a reasonably close relationship with him. My practicality and focused perspective shaped my views on Hitler's regime, focusing less on moral or political implications of which I had limited knowledge and more on its effects on the German military. Despite my initial discontent with the rise of the undisciplined and unprofessional SA and SS, Hitler's military expansion starting on the 16th of March 1935 caught my attention and approval. With the reintroduction of conscription, increased weapons production and the remodeling of the military into the Wehrmacht, rapid promotions for existing officers ensued. By early 1936 I had risen to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. In 1937 my reputation as an instructor at the Potsdam War Academy and the success of my book on military tactics, infantry attacks, garnered the attention of Hitler and the German High Command. Hitler assigned me as second in command of his personal escort battalion in October 1938. Spending more time with the Führer, I found myself somewhat charmed by Hitler's immense charisma, leading me to mentally separate him from his party and trust in his leadership, despite my repugnance for the Nazis. While I built a connection with Hitler, Europe was heading towards another war, propelled by Hitler's rapid violations of the Treaty of Versailles. German troops marched into the demilitarized Rhineland in 1936, reunited with Austria in 1938, and then set their sights on Czechoslovakia. Despite the policy of appeasement by Britain and France, Hitler's annexation of the Sudetenland in 1938 and the occupation of the rest of Czechoslovakia in March 1939 revealed his determination to pursue German expansion. The Allies presented an ultimatum, vowing to declare war if Hitler attacked Poland. I had a front row seat to these events as I commanded Hitler's escort when he entered Prague. As a newly promoted Major General, I was in charge of Hitler's guard during the invasion of Poland on the 1st of September 1939, marking the beginning of the Second World War. From my position at the Führer's headquarters, I gained insight into the campaign and witnessed the devastating effects of the Blitzkrieg as Panzer divisions swiftly cut across Poland, bringing the country to submission in just five weeks. Recognizing the compatibility between my command style and the speed achieved by the Panzers, I desired the command of one of these coveted divisions. In February 1940, my wish was granted. 
when I was given command of the 7th Panzer Division for the upcoming invasion of France. On the 10th of May, the invasion of France began, with the German Panzer Divisions breaking through the Ardennes Forest on the Franco-Belgian border they overran Belgium and Holland, encircling the forward-placed Allied divisions, forcing the British and French forces to retreat to the Channel. My division, the 7th Panzer, was among the first to cross the Meuse River on the 13th of May, opening the floodgates for the German army's rapid advance to the coast. This swift campaign was carried out with astonishing speed, often with me leading the division from the front, barking orders to the infantry, jumping on tank turrets to replace wounded crewmen. My tenacious hands-on leadership was uncharacteristic of typical divisional commanders, marking me as an eccentric and exceptional leader. However, my aggressive and impulsive style sometimes caused my column to race far ahead of the rest of the division. On one occasion, we covered a staggering 50 miles in a 24-hour period. The speed of our advance often prevented the German high command from keeping track of my unit, leading to the sarcastic nickname Ghost Division for the 7th Panzer. Some historians even suggested that our whirlwind advance, including myself, might have been aided by the German-made methamphetamine Perwitten, widely distributed among the, the Wehrmacht vanguard before the invasion. An account from the time even claimed that, possibly intoxicated, I ran over a column of French infantry during the advance. One of my closest chaves during the French campaign occurred at Arras on the 20th of May, where I faced my first encounter with the British Army. Two British tank regiments counter-attacked against the German advance, nearly succeeding and sending shockwaves through the German high command. Concerns about thinning and vulnerable lines of advance led to a halt for the Panzer divisions on the 24th of May. Although the advance resumed on the 26th, this delay allowed the British expeditionary force to reach the channel ports and ultimately evacuate from Dunkirk, between the 27th of May and the 4th of June. Following the capture of Lilla on the 31st of May, I attended a private conference with Hitler and the German High Command. The plan for overrunning the remainder of France was outlined and the so-called Fall Rot or Case Red began on the 5th of June. My division advanced rapidly, crossing the River Somme and reaching the French coast by the 10th of June. On that day, hundreds of miles away from my panzers, fascist Italy declared war on Britain and France aiming to gain colonial territory in Africa, this event would significantly impact my life. As I was sent to North Africa to save Italy's Libyan colony from the British invasion, marking the introduction of the Desert Fox to the world. The German high command consumed by Operation Barbarossa, the gigantic German invasion of Soviet Russia, launched in June 1941, viewed the North African front as a sideshow. Throughout the campaign, I was frustrated as the German high command seemed oblivious to my desert theater of war, while my British opponents were strongly supported and closely watched over by London. The initial plan from the German general staff of the Africa Corps was to hold the Italian position in Western Libya while being preoccupied with Operation Barbarossa. However, I had different plans. Believing that attack was the best form of defense on the desert front, I decided to take the war to the enemy. Despite the general staff's intention to focus on holding defensive positions, I engaged in insubordination, deceiving them about the true nature of my campaign. There was also tension and distrust between me and the Italian commander in the region, Marshal Italo Garibaldi, as I was determined to take the lead in operations. On the 24th of March, my first offensive operation began with the capture of the Libyan port of El Aguila. British forces retreating to Merce El Brega faced little resistance. My tendency as a commander was to exploit any enemy weakness to its fullest extent. I believed in continuous movement, pressing the advantage once the enemy was on the back foot, a strategy proven successful in the German campaign in France in 1940. With these tactics in mind, I attacked Merci El Brega on the 31st of March, then assaulted Agadabia on the 2nd of April. The British forces depleted by the diversion of forces to Greece faced continuous pressure, moving north towards Benghazi, the major port was abandoned by the British on the 3rd of April. The capture of Lieutenant Generals Neem and O'Connor on the 7th of April paralyzed the British chain of command. Seizing the opportunity, I ordered the Africa Corps, along with two Italian motorized divisions, to advance upon the British fortress of Tobruk on the 10th of April. If taken, it would force the British to retreat into Egypt, leaving the Suez Canal, my ultimate target, vulnerable. In just over two weeks, I turned the situation in North Africa completely on its head, stunning both British and German high command alike. By the 11th of April, the Tobruk fortress was surrounded, but the Allied forces, determined not to abandon the crucial port, put up stern resistance. Thus began a seven-month-long struggle to capture the Tobruk. My initial attacks were met with fierce defense, notably at El Adem, 
on the 4th of April where Australian forces inflicted heavy losses on our panzers and machine gun battalions. Amidst military frustrations, I faced irritation from Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, who inaccurately claimed in a biography that I joined the Nazi party in the 1920s. I demanded a correction, emphasizing my dedication to the German army rather than the National Socialist regime. Skepticism from German army chief of staff Franz Halder led to an inspection by General Paulus on the 25th of April. After repeated failed assaults, Paulus instructed me to cease direct assaults on Tobruk and lay siege instead. Following the orders of the German high command, the intercepted reports to Berlin revealed our weak position, prompting British Prime Minister Winston Churchill to plan Operation Battle Axe to relieve Tobruk. Launched on the 15th of June, the operation faced well-prepared defensive positions and devastating German Edeke Aimedin Davis anti-tank guns, shifting to the offensive, he foreseed the British to retreat, leading to the failure of Operation Battle Axe by the afternoon of the 17th of June. The defeat prompted the replacement of British Commander Archibald Waville with Claude Oshilek on the 21st of June. Celebrating what I considered a complete victory, I prepared for an offensive in late November to capture Tobruk, while Oshilek planned an attack to push the Germans away from the fortress, aiming to succeed where Operation Battleaxe had failed. After the failure of Operation Battleaxe, Churchill redirected British focus and resources to the North African Front. Additional divisions from the British Empire arrived, but the Afrika Korps received no attention or supplies from Germany due to the launch of Operation Barbarossa on June 22. Rommel and Auchinleck engaged in a race to launch their own assault first. While I had planned to attack Tobruk on November 24th, Operation Crusader was launched by the British on November 18th. Realizing my assault on Tobruk had to be postponed, I moved my units to face the British. After four days of fighting, the British suffered significant losses and I counter-attacked causing panic among British officers in what became known as the dash to the wire, attempting to reach the Egyptian border. However, my panzer assaults failed and I withdrew. From November 29th to December 6th, both sides sought tactical advantages. By December 7th, lacking supplies and tanks, I called a withdrawal from Tobruk, retreating to Gazala. The Allies pressed forward, forcing me to abandon Gazala on December 13th and retreat to El Aghaila by January 10th, 1942. Though not a rout, my retreat was completed with reluctance. Standing on the same ground from where the campaign began, I understood the key to desert warfare was not gaining ground but destroying the enemy's tanks, troops and supply lines. I sensed weakness among the British forces, operating at the end of a precarious 500-mile supply line. The Japanese attacks in Southeast Asia forced British troop withdrawals. Reinforced with new panzers, I launched a swift assault on January 21st. 1942. The British, stunned by the strength of the assault, fell back and the Axis retook Benghazi on January 29th. The Allies withdrew to the Ghazala Ridge, establishing a defensive line. Halting at the, at the Ghazala line, but both sides planned offensives for late May. On May 26th, I launched an assault, using a feint maneuver in the center as a distraction for a large flanking maneuver to the south. Though initially successful, British reinforcements ground down the attack Forming the Africa Corps into a defensive posture known as the Cauldron, I resumed the offensive on May 30th. Leading from the front, I averted enemy fire and by June 12th, forced the British forces to withdraw from the Gazala line. Approaching Tobruk, I was determined to avoid a prolonged siege. The assault on the fortress began on June 20th, concentrating artillery fire and waves of bombers to stun the British. On June 21st, the Africa Corps captured Tobruk, taking 32,000 prisoners, the second largest capitulation of British soldiers in the entire war. Germany celebrated, and Hitler promoted me to the rank of Field Marshal, making me the youngest Field Marshal in the German army at 49. Undeterred by this moment of glory, I pressed my advantage. On June 24th, Axis tanks rolled across the Egyptian frontier, surrounding the coastal town of Mirsa Matru. By June 26th, forcing the British to abandon it and continue their eastward retreat. The British decided to make their last stand at El Alamein, 60 miles west of Alexandria. Unable to flank the British position due to the impassable desert to the south and the Mediterranean to the north, I attempted to pierce the center of the British defenses, starting the attack on July 1st. By the end of July, the battle had developed into a stalemate. Exhausted and facing supply issues, my forces were thinning with fewer than 100 operational tanks. RAF dominance in the skies hindered the Africa Corps from breaking the British lines. The stalemate continued until the British, dissatisfied with Auchinleck, replaced him with Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery on August 8th. Realizing I would lose a steady war with my limited supplies, 
I felt compelled to attack the British and attempt to unbalance them. On August 30, at Alam el Halfa Ridge, I attempted to pin down the enemy with a frontal assault while attacking from the south. However, my forces were repulsed and the attack was called off on September 2. On September 23, I was recalled to Germany on sick leave due to a liver infection and low blood pressure. I implored the German High Command for greater supplies but received only empty promises. Meanwhile in North Africa, Montgomery was preparing for the great British attack to push the Afrika Korps out of Egypt and Libya. The Second Battle of El Alamein began on October 23rd with a massive British artillery barrage. Although the Allied attack stalled on the first day, Montgomery, with a numerical advantage, prepared to overcome the enemy. When I returned to the front lines on October 25th, the Axis forces lacked the resources to fend off the British onslaught. Facing a dire situation, I ordered a retreat on November 2nd. Informing Berlin of my decision, I received a shocking reply from Hitler himself ordering the Afrika Corps to stand and fight to the last man. Torn between soldierly duty and commander's responsibility, I refused to blindly sacrifice my men and announced, my men's lives come first, the Führer is crazy. On November 8th, American forces began Operation Torch, making amphibious landings in Morocco and Algeria. Realizing the end for the Africa Corps, I fought a series of delaying actions against Montgomery, retreating to Tunisia despite Hitler's protestations, with the plan to hold off the Allies and evacuate the army. As of December 18th, my army was in Tripolitania, and by January 22nd we reached the Marath Line in Tunisia, where I intended to make a stand. The attack on American forces at the Kasserine Pass on February 19th resulted in a sharp defeat for the Allies, temporarily boosting my spirits. However, it was a Pyrrhic victory, and the weight of American forces compelled me to withdraw from Kasserine, turning to face the British, advancing from the east at the Marath Line. I attacked on March 6th, but the assault failed as 500 British anti-tank guns tore through my units. On March 9th, I formally handed over command of the Africa Corps to General von Arnim, left Tunisia to meet with Hitler, who decorated me for my service and ordered me on sick leave. This marked the end of my time in North Africa, and on May 13th, Axis forces in Tunisia surrendered to the Allies. When Benito Mussolini was overthrown on July 25, 1943, I was returned to command, posted on the northern Italian border, with the Italian armistice on September 8th confirming German fears. I desired supreme command of the Italian theater, but Hitler gave this position to Albert Kesselring instead. On November 5th, I became the general inspector of the Western defenses, tasked with preparing the German defenses on the Atlantic coast for the inevitable Allied invasion. Inspecting the Atlantic defenses, I found stark inadequacies with barely half of the ordered fortifications complete and many falling into disrepair. Feeling betrayed by Hitler, I aimed to create an impenetrable Atlantic wall of defense. I believed the Allies must be stopped on the coastal beaches themselves, ordering extensive fortifications, anti-tank barriers, and a focus on mines. By the time the Allies landed, six million mines were laid, although my original plan had called for 20 million. The strongest defenses were centered on the Pas de Calais, the port believed to be the likely target of the Allied invasion. Allied Operation Fortitude reinforced this belief, convincing the Germans that Pas de Calais was the target. As June 1944 opened, German intelligence suggested unpredictable weather, leading me to return to Germany for Lucy's 50th birthday on July 6th, leaving on July 4th, certain that the weather would prevent the Allies from striking. On the morning of June 6th, I received the news that Allied forces had landed on the beaches of Normandy. Putting down the phone, I muttered, Normandy, how stupid of me, and rushed back to France. The Normandy campaign would be my last, and unlike previous operations, I was not near the front. My lack of independence and command led to disputes with the German military hierarchy rather than engagement with the enemy. Attempting to persuade Hitler of the desperate situation and the need for peace proved futile, as Hitler refused any form of retreat. The failed assassination attempt on Hitler on July 20 heightened tensions. Hitler's paranoia-fueled vengeance resulted in the execution of 5,000 suspects, including me. A conspiracy to remove Hitler had long existed within the German army hierarchy. There is debate over the extent of my involvement, but evidence suggests connections to a group of officers intending to depose Hitler for the country's sake. While I likely knew of the plot, my passivity in the bomb plot of July 20th became evident during investigations. As I recovered from my injuries, I realized my house was being watched. On October 14th, two generals informed me of suspicions related to the plot. I was given the choice to face a court or take my own life with poison. I chose the latter. 
and moments later, I committed suicide in a staff car. My state funeral in Ulm was celebrated with pomp and prestige. Officially, it was declared that I died of my wounds. The funeral oration falsely claimed his heart belonged to the Führer, a lie known only to those who truly knew Erwin Rommel. If, like the unfolding drama on the battlefield, this journey has captured your imagination, I implore you to lend your voice to the conversation. Drop a comment below, share your thoughts, insights, or perhaps the historical figures you'd like us to unravel next. For those who've yet to pledge allegiance to our channel, consider this an invitation to join our ever-growing legion. Hit that subscribe button, tap the notification bell, and become a part of our community dedicated to unraveling the mysteries of the past. Don't forget to marshal your support by smashing the like button. Until our next rendezvous, may your thirst for knowledge be unquenchable, and may history's lessons guide you on your journey. Farewell, my comrades, and may the echoes of history linger in your hearts.